Good morning and happy Friday, YouTube. We're here for another episode of AI News, Drama, and Updates. I didn't completely expect to blow anyone's mind this morning, but I feel like I'm about to. I just came across this article from a company called Cortical Labs. This company has allegedly been able to use neural stem cells combined with silicon to create what they're calling organoid intelligence, or OI. Now, this is clearly a very eye-catching headline, and we're definitely going to have to dig much deeper into this type of tech, because it's the first I've even heard of it. But I mean, just reading through what the article is claiming here is pretty wild. The company has basically created a cluster of these stem cells. It's calling it a dish brain. And I thought this part was clever because once it's hooked up to hard silicon, they're calling it a biological intelligence operating system, a BIOS. If this sounds wild, unbelievable, and futuristic, I agree. I did briefly check into their website. It's designed in a way that I hate, where you have to just keep scrolling. But there are research papers here that I will link in the description below for anyone who's curious enough to read through it. And it looks like some experimentation was put into place with a simulated game world as well. This organoid intelligence-based technology was able to play a game of Pong from what I gathered. But I'll link everything in the description below. Go ahead and check it out if you care. Moving on from here is a brief story in the world of law. While I haven't seen a lot of AI companies, startups, or really anything come out of Europe, I've seen a lot of people with concerns in the EU about the impact of AI, and there's been a lot of attempts to regulate from what it seems. We've even covered stories about Italy and France and a lot of other concerns that they've had. Italy, for the moment, seems to still be having a problem with ChatGPT. But if you hear anything about ECAT, it is the European Center for Algorithmic Transparency. And they do have some valid concerns, things like discrimination, things like biases. But unfortunately, each time they come up, the reality is that they are just reflections of human nature. We really do need to solve those issues. We need to solve them in the real world, but we're only seeing them in our large language models because they exist within our reality. They exist within our stories. They exist within all of our training material. And don't get me wrong, I'm biased. Everyone is biased. They exist within the researchers themselves. So I don't know that it's ever anything that we can completely get away from. And while I've seen some calls for regulation in the States, you know, things like that open letter and things like that, I haven't really seen any groups like this form within the States here that are going to have any kind of power over these companies. But we'll keep an eye on this and see what happens. But moving on from here, we got a lot to talk about when it comes to BARD. And I want to cover the good, the bad, and the ugly. So first thing I will say is Google has made some improvements to BARD. It looks like it's been given the ability to work with code, which was a little bit of a shortcoming before. Of course, it's not great, and it's not going to really be able to compete yet with GitHub's Copilot or even GPT, but it is a sign that Google's listening to the users and hopefully improving things therein. In the world of these chatbots, as we're comparing one next to the other, though, BARD is not anywhere near the level of the other ones. It's just not. I mean, you can see elements of that here in this article. You can even see examples where it's failing. One of the stories that came out this week was some internal Google communication where it looks like employees were telling higher ups or encouraging them not to release Bard in the first place. Some people called it a liar. Some people called it worse than useless. Uh, the biggest concerns, though, was that it was potentially dangerous. Even if you ask Bard itself, it can give you advice that it will confirm could be potentially dangerous. So you can imagine these types of internal memo leaks are probably not a great thing as far as the PR for Google is concerned. Now, I don't think for anyone that's actually used it at all, any of these concerns or any of the things that are being said here are going to come as any kind of surprise. BART is obviously not ready, and it wasn't good, it never was. Even myself having covered the headlines around that time, I felt painfully aware of how desperate Google might have felt in that moment and how cornered they were to kind of release something that was AI-powered, especially given that GPT technology is based on Google research in the first place. If Google's not able to find a way to monetize and keep up with the AI race, they're going to fade into obscurity. As we continue talking about the Bard saga, and we're going to touch into just Google's future plans, but we are seeing where Google's allowing AI-generated content within ad space now. But it seems like for the first time in a very long time, Google's bottom line has been directly threatened. Not only does this AI chaos bring a ton of upheaval to Google, but also Samsung is now considering dumping Google as its default search provider on their Android phones. And with Samsung being one of the largest Android providers, this is a big deal for Google. But credit where it's due, Bing has actually improved in drastic ways, and it is very quickly becoming a de facto search provider for a lot of people just based on the changes. All right, shifting gears a little bit, let's get into GPT technology and the future of large language models like ChatGPT and others. Now, they're going to need training material, and that training material needs to come from us, technically, or just really any kind of writing that exists, any kind of images, the more material that goes into these multimodal models, the better and better they can get. Luckily, we've got the internet. We've got places where we've collected large amounts of conversational data back and forth. We've even got places like Reddit 
where there's an upvote system that shows how useful that information was to an extent. You know what I mean? So if you picture yourself as a company like OpenAI that needs this type of material, Reddit is seeing this as a potential opportunity to become profitable. So Reddit is one of the sites that for a long time has had a very difficult time becoming profitable. Over the years, they've tried a number of different things, but in this instance, what they're going to do or what they're deciding to do is sell their data. But as I say that, I want to also point out that this isn't necessarily their data. It is your data. Now, of course, the terms of service on each website is going to be different, but I don't know if copyright goes away, but this is going to bring up some very interesting questions in the courts of the future, I'm sure. Because a lot of these sites, whether it's Reddit, Stack Overflow, Twitter, they hold data. They're a platform, but they don't necessarily own that data, do they? When you upload a picture to Instagram, for example, does Instagram now own that picture? Can they sell it to other people as training data? Or do you still own the copyright? And I'm definitely not a lawyer. I can't get into the nuts and bolts of this, but it does bring up some interesting questions, and I'm very curious to see where it goes. This, like everything else, of course, we're going to keep an eye on and see what happens. Last week, we talked about how Elon Musk bought a ton of different GPUs after signing the open letter. I saw some articles out there where some other major publications were calling him out on that as well, so I was glad to see that. So the update that I have for you on the Elon Musk story, and it's really not much, it's just that he's decided to call this new AI system Truth GPT. It's going to understand the nature of the universe, apparently. And while it seems like a terrifying idea to me to use Twitter data to create a large language model, I am very curious to see what comes out. So we'll keep an eye on that if and when it happens. Now, moving on from one character who signed that open letter, we're going to move on to another one. Imad, the CEO of Stability AI, has now announced that they are also creating a ChatGPT competitor. Stability AI has released a ChatGPT-like language model. I want to point out that Imad signed the open letter to pause AI development while working on this model. But that aside, it's now released. So Imad and friends are calling this Stable LM. It may be a little bit better than Vicuna. It's really hard for me to say. I didn't play with it for very long. But I will, of course, leave some links if you want to check it out for yourself. And I definitely don't mind yet another large language model out there, especially if it is a good one. I, I just couldn't move past the story without pointing out the hypocrisy in trying to pause AI development while working on your own model. I have some Adobe news for you, which is a little bit rare, but this is in the text to video realm, or actually more in this particular instance, it may be video to video. It looks like based on the article here that they're doing some runway like stuff within. I don't know if this is Adobe Premiere. I don't know if this is a kind of a standalone program. Now, maybe you're seeing this and you're like, hey, that looks like Runway ML. I agree. And I think the demonstration is very, very similar. I don't know that it's actually the same technology, though. And Runway ML was based on Stable Diffusion, whereas Firefly is a completely different model with different training. That said, one of the former VPs of Stability AI worked at Adobe. And I don't know how much of this crossover there really could have been. So hard to say, but hopefully this improves Adobe products. It seems weird to say because NVIDIA has been really the hardware source behind a lot of this, but now they're releasing a lot of software and enterprise utilities and things like that. This week we saw a stable diffusion based text to video model and you can tell it's uh, kind of terrifying. I love, love, love the concept of text to video, but obviously a lot of these are still just not ready for prime time. They're great for memes though. Really quick update for you on Snapchat is Snapchat's AI is up and running. And I've actually seen some fun feedback from it on Twitter and some other spaces where people have been, you know, either being gaslit by the bot or it's, you know, insulting them, all kinds of different fun stuff. I'm not a big Snapchat user myself, but I like the ideas that I'm seeing here from some of the presentation stuff. It would seem they did some really cool stuff like having it analyze your photos. So you take a photo of something like a vegetable in your garden and it could recommend a recipe for you, for example. And while I'm not sure exactly how useful that is specifically to Snapchat, that is actually just a kind of a cool idea that I hadn't seen anywhere else. And I'm going to end this week in talking about one of the bigger stories in AI and something that you may or may not have heard of, but a AI generated Drake and The Weeknd song was pulled down from streaming platforms. I have a feeling we've only really seen the beginning of this kind of thing happening because the reality is, and I'll be making a video about it soon, but emulating voices is even easier than something like images or something like text. You know, you're going to see stuff like this get taken down right away, but you're also going to see hundreds of examples popping up on TikTok and other places at the same time. Now, I can't help but point out the ridiculous irony of a company like Universal Music Group saying that this is unethical towards artists. But I'm going to leave that topic for another day, and we'll just talk about the AI element. It's all going to come down to copyright, and what the Copyright Office has said is everything, including music, cannot be copyrighted if it was produced by providing a text prompt to a generative AI model. So the question remains is, 
how can this happen if nobody owns this copyright? So that's the issue that we're going to need to see play out in courts. We're going to need to see decisions made based on that. And I mentioned it in previous videos. I think that this entire concept of AI really just destroys the original idea behind what copyright protected. You know, maybe it's time to do things in a different way so we can keep things fair. But that's all I had for you today. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please make sure to like, subscribe, dislike it even if you didn't like it. You know, all that stuff really helps with the YouTube algorithm. And I do really appreciate all the interactions. I'll see you next Friday for another headlines video if I don't see you first for something else. But in the meantime, thanks for watching.